Ladies and gentlemen, our belief in Almighty God is not blind, it's not baseless, because when we come to the Bible, what we find is that Bible prophecy proves the existence of God. In the third chapter of Amos, in verse 7, we read these words. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now the New International Version and other translations would put it this way, surely the Lord God will do nothing without revealing his plan unto his servants, the prophets. And so what you find is that fulfilled and fulfilling Bible prophecy lets us see that God exists and that he is working among the nations and will accomplish his purpose with the earth and with mankind upon it. And so we might start by considering then how the Bible originated, how Bible prophecy originated. And as the Apostle Peter wrote his second epistle, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, he said this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now that has been translated by other translations in this way. Weymouth has the prophet's own prompting, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of the prophet's own prompting. McKnight translates it, is of the prophet's own invention. And the New Living Translation has the prophet's own understanding. Peter goes on to say, For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so what we have in the Bible, what we have in Bible prophecy, is what God caused men to write under inspiration, and this has come down to us in the Word of God, the Bible. And so Paul, for example, in 2 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says this, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, God moved the people who wrote the Bible to write in the way that they did and to record the things that they did. <coughs> and so, we can summarise the matter to this point in this way. Firstly, before God acts, he reveals his intentions. Secondly, what the Bible reveals is inspired by God. God caused the men who wrote the Bible to write the things they did and to write in the way that they did. And the third point is, if Bible prophecy can be shown to be accurate and has been and is being fulfilled, this demonstrates that God exists and that he is working to bring about his stated purpose, that purpose which he has set out in the Bible. And in this connection, this evening in particular, we want to concentrate on the importance of Israel. And it is an important matter because God himself declares that the nation of Israel are his witnesses to the fact that he is God and that beside him there is no other God. Now we're going to spend the most of the night in the book of Deuteronomy, but just as we commence I'd like you to come with me please to Isaiah chapter 43 and in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah and at verse 1, this is what we read. But thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. So this is the context, you see. He that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. So we know that the 43rd chapter of Isaiah is about Israel. Come down to verse 10. God says to Israel, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, 
and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. I have declared and saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, speaking to Israel, he says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And if you come across to the 44th chapter, we read in verse 1, Yet now hear, O Jacob my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. So we're dealing with the nation of Israel. Notice what verse 8 says. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you that from that time, and have declared it, ye are even my witnesses. So see what God is saying. Israel are his witnesses. Ye are even my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. And so God declares that the nation of Israel are his witnesses to the fact that he exists and that he is the only true God. Without, apart from God, there is no other God. And Israel witnesses to that fact. That is what God himself declares. So in looking at Israel in this talk, we're going to largely concentrate on the book of Deuteronomy. And so if you've got your Bible with you this evening, I would like you to come with me to the book of Deuteronomy. We'll see what it's about and we'll see some of the prophecies which the book of Deuteronomy records. All right. And the book of Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible. And Moses is the inspired author of what is written in that book. And you can see that if you were to turn up Deuteronomy 1 verse 1 and Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 10. And Moses wrote some 1,500 years before the birth of Christ. In other words, some three and a half thousand years ago. And Israel, after 40 years in the wilderness, and after their exodus from Egypt, Moses having led the nation out of Egypt, the time had come when he was about to die. And the nation of Israel were about to enter into the land of Canaan, the land which we know today as the land of Israel. They were about to enter into the land of Canaan under the leadership of another man, another leader, under the leadership of Joshua. And in these circumstances, Moses spoke the words which are recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. And at the time that Moses spoke these words, Israel were east of Jordan, but north of of the Dead Sea. They were here, there's a map of Israel, up there you can see Jericho, but they were on the other side of Jordan to that, they were over by Mount Nebo, which is the area where Moses actually died, and up there the, book, the words of Moses were spoken, and consequently we can say that the book of Deuteronomy was given. Now, in three chapters, in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapters 28 to 30, Moses sets out prophetically the destiny of Israel, the destiny of the Jewish people, from that day to this and on into the future. It is a prophecy spanning three and a half thousand years. And when you come to examine it, what you find, ladies and gentlemen, is that it is a prophecy which is now nearly all fulfilled. And this fulfilment provides outstanding proof of the existence of God. Because you can see what was said three and a half thousand years ago. You can look down through history, you can look at the situation today, and you can say, that prophecy is absolutely accurate. Moses wrote that prophecy under inspiration by God, from God, and it is a proof that in fact God exists. The fulfilment of these prophecies provides outstanding proof of the existence of God. Now, 
We can look at this initially just in summary, and then I'll come back, God willing, and I'll deal with some of these verses in more detail. So if we were to summarise these chapters, Deuteronomy chapter 28 to chapter 30, we would find this. In Deuteronomy 28, between verses 1 and 14, we have God's pronouncement of the blessings which would come in the land if the children of Israel obeyed. In Deuteronomy 28, between verses 15 and 24, we have set out the cursings which would come upon the children of Israel if they disobeyed while they were in the land. Perhaps we should just look at these. Have a look with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and this is where we're going to spend 28, 29 and 30, where we're going to spend most of this evening. In Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1, we read, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. So there are going to be blessings for obedience. Verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So there's blessings for obedience. The cursings for disobedience are set out later in the chapter. Let's have a look at verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and shall overtake thee. Have a look at verse 19 and verse 20. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. In verses 25 to 35 of chapter 28, we find that the land of Israel was going to be invaded if disobedience, if, they were, if the children of Israel were disobedient, that the land of Israel was going to be invaded and dominated by foreigners. Just have a look at verse 25, for example, where we read, The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So they were going to be dispersed into all the countries of the earth. And in fact, as we will see, God willing, a little later in this talk, the power which is being specifically referred to here in verse 25 was the power of Assyria, which was going to come down and invade the land of Israel and take many captive and so forth and so on. All right. When we come to verses 36 to 37 of Deuteronomy 28, we find that there is a specific prophecy which says that Israel's king and the nation of Israel were going to be taken captive. Let's have a read Deuteronomy 28 and verse 36. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there thou shalt serve other gods, wood and stone. And as a matter of fact, 500 years, 500 years elapsed before Israel appointed their first human king. 500 years after this prophecy was given. But you can see from that verse, that the verse says that they were going to have a human king, that Israel were going to have a human king. And the verse is actually dealing, the verse we have just read, Deuteronomy 28 and verse 36, is actually a reference to the Babylonian captivity, which occurred a thousand years after this prophecy was given. And we'll look at this in more detail a little later. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 38 to 42, the Jewish people were going to return from the captivity and that's the captivity of Babylon, and they began to plant olive trees throughout the land. And you can read of that in verse 40 of Deuteronomy 28. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, 
All right? Olive trees throughout all their coasts, throughout all their suburbs and throughout the various parts of the land. That's what we're told. That is, after they returned from the captivity. Then, in Deuteronomy 28, between verses 43 and 46, Moses said, well, if you're disobedient, then foreign, foreigners were going to rule over you. As a matter of fact, this is a reference to the Romans, and we'll look again at this a little later. But in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 43, we read, The stranger that is in thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. In verses 47 to verse 62 of Deuteronomy 28, we were told, or Moses said, that Israel were going to be afflicted with a yoke of iron. Let's read verses 48 and 49, for example. Therefore thou shalt serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. We will see a little later, this, is a, this was a reference to the Roman invasion of AD 70. And then in verses 63 to 68 of Deuteronomy 28, we, were told, we are told that the Jews were going to be dispersed throughout the earth, and there they were going to experience distress and disaster. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even gods of wood and of stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give me there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. And so, as we know, anti-Semitism spread throughout the world, the Jewish people having been dispersed into all the countries of the world, anti-Semitism arose. Then coming down to the next chapter, chapter 29 and verse 22, we are told, or Moses told them, that their land was going to become barren and desolate after the Romans had caused them to be dispersed into all the countries of the earth. So we read in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 22, so that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from afar, from a far land, shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it, that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adamah and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. And so we're told that Jews having been cast out of the land by the Romans, that the land would become barren and desolate. And then in chapter 30, verses 1 to 5, we have Israel's restoration to their land set out. Let's just take verses 3 to 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 30. And then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out into the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee, and the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. All right. So there we have a summary of Deuteronomy chapter 20, chapters 28 to 30. Now let's come back and look more specifically 
at some of these prophecies. Firstly, we're told, for example, in Deuteronomy 28, verses 25 and 26, that the Jews were going to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. All right. Now let's just consider this. And thou shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Now this commenced to take place when the kingdom of Assyria came down invaded the land of Israel and took many of the northern kingdom because the kingdom of Israel ended up being divided into two, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And Assyria came down and took many of the Jews in the northern kingdom captive back to Assyria, as we can read in 2 Kings 17 verses 1 to 23. Now, there were subsequent captivities and removals, for example, the Babylonian captivity, which you can read about in 2 Kings 24, verses 10 to 17. And even today, ladies and gentlemen, you can look out on the earth and you can see that the prophecy which Moses spoke three and a half thousand years ago is fulfilled. Because there are Jews today in just about every country of the earth. The total population of Jews throughout the world is about 14.2 million. In Israel there are 6.4 million. In the United States 5.3 million. In France 465,000. In Canada 385,000. In the United Kingdom 269,000. In Russia 186,000. In Argentina 181,000, in Australia 112,500, in Germany nearly 100,000, in Brazil 95,000, and so you can go on as it trickles down right through the countries of the earth. The Jewish people are to be found, and that is witness to the fact that the Bible is the inspired word of God. God said what was going to happen, they were going to be dispersed into all the countries of the earth, and they have been, ladies and gentlemen. They have been. All right? Now, let's take another prophecy. Moses said in Deuteronomy 28, verses 36 to 37, writing under inspiration, as we pointed out in the beginning, that Israel's king and nation were going to be taken into captivity. Let's have a look. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 36. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known and there thou shalt serve other gods of wood and of stone. Now let's notice the terms of that verse. Thy king which thou shalt set over thee. Now ladies and gentlemen this is a truly remarkable prophecy because you know Israel didn't have a human king until approximately 400 years after Moses spoke these words. Not only that, but Israel themselves were going to be instrumental, says Moses, in setting up their system of human monarchs, and they were going to do that against the wishes of God. Notice, which thou shall set up over thee. And if we were to turn up 1 Samuel 8 and verses 5 to 7, we will have the circumstances in which the Jewish people rejected God as their king and said, we want a human king. And they appointed Saul as the king over themselves. And so again, a remarkable prophecy, which had a fulfilment 400 years after Moses spoke the words, when the Jewish people set up a human king, which thou shalt set over thee. All right. Now let's continue in that verse. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there thou shalt other, shall serve other gods of wood and of stone. Now the last Jewish king, the last Jewish king and the nation were taken captive to Babylon 
as is set out for us in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. And this happened some 950 years after Moses gave this prophecy. In Babylon, many of the Jewish people succumbed to idolatry. Daniel and his companions were notable exceptions to this. But you see, the prophecy was that the king of Israel and the nation were going to be taken captive, and they were. They were taken captive to Babylon, some 950 years after Moses gave this prophecy. All right. Now, Moses also said, writing under inspiration, that Israel was going to return from the captivity. If you have a look at Deuteronomy 28 and verse 40, this is what we read. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, throughout all thy land, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast out his fruit. So the, the Jewish people were going to return. They were going to plant olive trees, even though they weren't going to be too successful with what they planted. But nevertheless, they were going to come back into the land and they were going to plant olive trees. And of course, they did return. They did return. Let's have a look. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts. And coasts really means country. And you can see that, if, for example, if you look at the, trans the New International Version translation. So this implies a return to the land of Israel after the Babylonian captivity. Some of the Jewish captives did indeed return under the leadership of Zerubbabel, as you can see from Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and under the leadership of Ezra, as you can see from Ezra chapter 8 and verse 1. They rebuilt the temple which Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar being the king of Babylon, as you can see from Ezra chapter 4 and verse 10, although the temple which had been destroyed, which was Solomon's temple, when they rebuilt it, it was built on a far less magnificent scale, as Haggai chapter 2 and verse 3 points out. It was this king, this temple rather, that King Herod later replaced and enlarged and beautified and so that, in the days of the Lord, it was known as Herod's temple. All right? It was known as Herod's temple. But Moses said that having been scattered into all the countries of the earth, after they returned, foreigners were going to rule over the Israelites in the land. Have a look at verse 43 of Deuteronomy 28. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come very low. All right? The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high. Now, in the prophecy of Deuteronomy 28, we'll come specifically to the Roman domination of Israel in verses 47 to 62. But it is an amazing phenomenon of history, you know, that Rome never conquered Palestine, never conquered the land of Israel by war, but they conquered it by infiltration and gradually came to dominate it as a conqueror, as is set out in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 43. In the days of Christ, under the surveillance of Rome, King Herod, who was an Idumean, not a Jew, King Herod, who was an Idumean, ruled Judah, as we can read in Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. Whilst Rome remained the overlord, with Pilate being the Roman governor. As you can see, if you look up John 19, verse 15, and Matthew 27 and verse 2. And so here we've got a depiction of Herod's temple as it was in the days of the Lord. And there on the uh, northwestern uh, angle or uh, position of the temple, you can see what is known as the Fortress of Antonia. The fortress and of Antonia. It was an adjunct to the temple. It was an adjunct to the temple. And that fortress of Antonia, in the days of the Lord, in the days of Christ, bore silent witness to the truth of Deuteronomy 28 and verse 43. 
It was a reminder that the stranger within was indeed ruling over them because the fortress of Antonia was a Roman fortress. It was a Roman fortress. It was not only occupied by Roman soldiers, but it was the home of the Roman governor. It was the home of Pilate when he was in Jerusalem. So you see, with the stranger within came to dominate the Jewish people, precisely as Moses recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And while we're dealing with the Roman domination of Israel, let's have a look at verses 48 and 49 of Deuteronomy 28. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flyer. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to the young. Verse 52. And, thou, and, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest, throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, and thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, and the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege, and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. Now, there was going to be a yoke of iron, all right? He shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. And if we had time, we could take you to Daniel chapter 2 and we could show that the various empires in an image which King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, saw, the various empires were represented by metals. For example, Babylon was represented by a head of gold. The Medo-Persian Empire, which followed the Babylonian Empire, was represented by uh, breast and arms of silver. The Greek Empire, which followed the Medo-Persian Empire, had belly and thighs of brass. And then the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire, which followed the Greek Empire, had legs of iron. But right back in Deuteronomy 28, Moses pointed out that the Jewish people were going to have put upon them a yoke of iron. And that is a reference to Roman's domination of Israel. One of the symbols of Rome was iron, as seen, as I say, in this image which Nebuchadnezzar saw. The, egg, the legs of iron in the Colossus of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as set out in Daniel chapter 2, and representing the Roman Empire, were legs of iron. So some 1,400 years after this prophecy was given by Moses, or by God through Moses, back in Deuteronomy 28, some 1,400 years after that prophecy was given by Moses, it was fulfilled, and the Jewish people had put upon them a yoke of iron. All right, verse 49 says, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as the eagle flieth. And Rome, of course, was an empire which extended to all of the then known or the then inhabited world. And an eagle, not only was Rome represented by a yoke of iron, but it was represented by an eagle. And if you were to look up Wikipedia, you would find an aquila, or eagle was the prominent symbol used in ancient Rome, especially as the standard of a Roman legion, a legionary known as an aquifer, an aquilifa, or eagle bearer, carried this standard. Each legion carried one eagle. 
So notice what Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49 says, the Lord shall bring against thee a nation, shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, an apt description of Rome, as the eagle flies. And when Roman armies went forth, they went forth under the standard, as we have seen, of an eagle. But not only that, that verse also says, firstly we saw it was going to be a yoke of iron, then they were going to come as an eagle flies, again another identification with Rome, and then they were going to have a tongue, a language, a speech, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no language, there is no language more foreign to the structure and idiom of the Hebrew language, the language of the Jews, than Latin, the language of the Romans. And, of course, when the Romans came, the Jews didn't understand the language. They didn't understand Latin. It was completely foreign to them and to the way that their own language was, the Hebrew language was, struct was structured. And so this nation, the Roman nation, whose tongue thou shalt not understand, is going to come to dominate the land of Israel. All right, verse 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down wherein thou trustest. And this prophecy, of course, culminated in the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 at the hands of the Romans, right? because the Jews rebelled against Roman uh, rule and the Romans retaliated. Now there's an illustration of Herod's glorious temple which existed in the days of the Lord and existed up until AD 70. But of course, the Jews having rebelled against Rome, Rome reacted and Rome came down and Rome besieged Jerusalem, and the temple was set on fire, and the Jews suffered terribly. And as we saw in verse 53, and thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and daughters, in the siege, it's the siege of Rome, and in the straightness. Now Josephus, who is the Jewish historian, uh, and he was a personal witness to the events which took place in AD 70, claims that over 1.1 million people were killed during the, that is Jewish people, were killed during the initial siege by the Romans. And the majority of that 1.1 million, as I said a moment ago, were in fact Jewish. He reports that during the Roman siege of Jerusalem, there was mass starvation in which cannibalism widely occurred with some mothers even devouring their own children. And so here we have a prophecy given back in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 53, a prophecy which was fulfilled 1600 years after it was given by Moses. Now you know the Lord had something to say about the Jewish people and what was going to happen to them. He said in Matthew 27 and verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, and of course they killed him as well, subsequently to these words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing and you were not willing. If you just come across for a moment to Matthew 23, we'll read the next verse as well. Matthew 23 and verse 37. This is the authorised version. Matthew 23 and verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which is sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered my children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, behold, said the Lord, your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate, and it was. The Rome... Roman invasion and the destruction of Jerusalem and so forth caused all the Jews to be cast out of the land into all the countries of the world. 
And so there came dispersion and distress for the Jewish people. Back in Deuteronomy 28, and you'll read verses 64 to 67, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even to the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would to God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, would to God it were morning, for the fear of thine heart, wherein thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. All right? So, following the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in AD 70, the Jewish people were cast out of their land into all the countries of the then inhabited world where many of their descendants, as we pointed out earlier in this talk, remain to this day. In keeping with the prophecy of Deuteronomy 28, verses 65 and 66, in many of these countries they have suffered terrible persecution and violent anti-Semitism, such as, of course, was instituted, for example, by Hitler in the 1930s and in the 1940s. Verse 66 says, And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. And so, if you go back in history, back into the 1930s, here we have the progression of discrimination towards the Jews in Germany. The Nazi party and Adolf Hitler seized power in 1933 and slowly began their program against the Jews of Germany. In 1933, there were 566,000 Jews living in Germany, and each new year in Germany led to harsher policies directed towards the Jewish people. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, said Moses right back in Deuteronomy 28. And so when 1934 came along, the Jews then were not allowed to have a national or to have national health insurance. The SS was formed and Hitler becomes the Führer and receives a 90% approval rating from the people. And so his policy was the Jews are troublemakers, the Jews are a curse, the Jews have to be got rid of. And so in phase one of his anti-Semitism, the Jews were rounded up and they were told that they were going to be relocated. In fact, they were taken to the woods and were shot one by one, and their bodies were, bu were buried in mass graves. In phase two, the Jews were rounded up and told that they were going to be relocated in other parts of the country, relocated in vans. But the vans were equipped so that the van's exhaust was piped into the van, and the Jews, of course, in the vans suffocated and 700,000 Jews were killed in vans. But so far as Hitler was concerned this wasn't fast enough, a fast enough way of getting rid of the Jews and so we came to phase three, the camps. The Nazi leaders decided to drastically speed up the final solution. There were two different types of camps, concentration camps and extermination camps, and the Jews from all over occupied Europe were to be brought to one of these two camps. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, said God through Moses. And so here were the concentration camps and the death camps. Those shown in green were the concentration camps in Germany. Those shown in red were the death camps, right where people were taken and Jews were taken and they were exterminated. And so here it is by way of a graph. In Germany, 
you can see that there were more than 9,000, 9 million rather, Jews. There were 6 million Jews killed and there were something like just over 3 million Jews who survived. So, before Hitler's anti-Semitism, there were about 9.5 million Jews. In Germany, there were 6 million Jews killed and then the survivors were some 3.5 million. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. So, going back to Deuteronomy 29 now, we read that the land of Israel was to become barren and desolate. Let's have a look, Deuteronomy 29, verse 22. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 22. So the generation to come of your children that shall rise after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adamah and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. How did this state of desolation come about? Well, after the Roman invasion and the dispersion of the Jewish people into all the countries of the then inhabited earth, the trees in Israel were cut down for the purposes of war. This caused erosion to take place in the land of Israel and consequently much of the land became barren. Then, to make matters worse, when the Turks came to occupy the land, they placed a tax on trees. You know what people are like, they don't want to pay tax. So what did they do? Well, the people in the land chopped down the trees. They chopped down the trees to minimise the tax. And so the land became even more barren and desolate. Where forests once grew, the land became arid, arid and desolate. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a picture which uh, I got took back, I think, in 1988. It's Ben-Gurion's Desert Home. It's the kibbutz at Sidi Boka. Now, Sidi Boka is south of Beersheba, and Ben-Gurion's hope was that by establishing this kibbutz down there, that Jewish people would find a way of being able to graze cattle, to raise cattle in the desert. In fact, it's an enterprise, many of the Jewish enterprises uh, prosper, but this one, in fact, didn't prosper very well at all. That's what the land is like. It is exactly like that, and it's still like that today. And as you can see, again, the prophecy of Deuteronomy 28, which God gave to Moses to, to set out to the Jewish people, has come to pass. The land is desolate. The land was barren. But, of course, not only is Deuteronomy and the words of Moses set out the curses which were to come upon the people, but the ultimate uh, result was also set out. So Deuteronomy speaks of Israel's restoration to the land. Let's have a look. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 3. It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations with the Lord thy God have driven thee, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither, thy, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. All right. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 5, what we find is this. God's curses upon his people of Israel are not yet complete. They have not yet returned unto the Lord their God. They have not yet returned from all the nations where they were scattered. They do not have all the land which was promised to their forefathers. 
The fulfilment of this prophecy, which we have just read from Deuteronomy 30, and the verses in verses 1 to 5, the fulfilment of this prophecy awaits the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. The situation as it exists in the Middle East today is a partial, primary and preliminary indication of what the future holds for the restoration of God's people, the Jews, to their land after the return of Christ. Now time is going faster than I am with this address, but right back in, 19, right back in 1848, a prominent Christadelphian said that the pre-adventual colonisation, that is the, that which would take place before Christ's second coming, before his second advent, the pre-adventual colonisation of Palestine will be on purely political principles and the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the messiahship of Jesus and the truth as it is in him. And that is the situation today. They are back, but this is not a complete fulfilment of Deuteronomy chapter 30 by any stretch of the imagination. Not only that, as we set forth from this platform on many occasions, the Battle of Armageddon is to take place. It's a battle which will centre on the land of Israel. And so the Jewish people will, will experience further destruction before the ultimate fulfilment of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 5. Now, what I need to say to you in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, that without question, Israel is real. Israel is real. And its history, as revealed beforehand in Bible prophecy, witnesses to the absolute certainty of the existence of Almighty God. There can be absolutely no question about it. You can go through prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy and find detailed prophecies which have been precisely fulfilled and are still being fulfilled before our very eyes today. Ladies and gentlemen, the question for each of us is this. The question for you is this. Can you afford not to believe?